great to actually be, have a captive audience. Uh, my children are always telling me, please don't bore us any more with Jonathan Edwards while I get a chance to bore you all this afternoon. So in the popular imagination, Jonathan Edwards is synonymous with the hellfire preaching of the revivals that comprise the Great Awakening in colonial New England in the 1730s and 40s. His rhetorical style is easily identified by his most famous or infamous sermon, Sin is in the Hands of an Angry God, which is a staple of anthologies on uh, American literature. In it, Edwards paints a vivid picture of the appalling fate awaiting those who fail to repent. S speaking directly uh, to the congregation, he explains that God holds them over a pit, he says, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire. This wrathful deity, he says, abhors uh, his auditors, Edward's auditors, and is, as Edwards puts it, dreadfully provoked. His wrath burns like fire. God looks upon the members of the congregation as worthy of nothing, nothing else but to be cast into the fire, says Edwards, for God is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight, says Edwards. Indeed, his parishioners are apparently 10,000 times more abominable in God's eyes than the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. In other words, this is not a sermon for the faint-hearted. Although it does reflect a strain of hellfire preaching in Edward's work, his declamatory language doesn't distinguish it from other such Puritan sermons where the, the Jeremiah or mournful complaint of the preacher was a staple of congregational diets. Although Edwards made a lasting contribution to this genre, it's not representative of his homiletics as a whole. For this reason, it seems to me that it's unfortunate that it's become the one sermon text by which he is remembered and the means by which the myth of the hellfire Edwards has been kept alive. It's no surprise then that when one thinks of Edwards the preacher, the image conjured up is usually that of a tall, cadaverous man of stern, uncompromising visage, wearing a black Genevan gown with starch clerical bands and a powdered periwig atop his high, receding brow. That's how he is presented in the standard portrait of Edwards painted from life by Joseph Badger and reprinted on endless banner of truth book covers. If he's remembered as the preacher, it is standing in the high New England pulpit, somber, serious, holding in the palm of his hand a small rectangular prompt, prompt card on which is written in his crabbed, spidery hand the skeleton of the sermon he's reading. Anyone who's looked at Edwards' uh, handwriting will know what I'm talking about. It's reported that in his preaching, Edwards made little or no use of physical gesture, that he was not particularly demonstrative. Instead, he stood still, intoning each word with care and precision in order that his congregation would hear and understand the sentences he uttered. His sermons were not so much proclaimed as delivered. They were often works that would make as much sense written as read or as heard. In fact, a number of the works by which he is remembered began their lives as sermons preached to his congregation. An instructive report of Edwards the preacher is given by one of his closest disciples, the theologian and minister Samuel Hopkins, who says this, and I quote him, His appearance in the desk, in other words the pulpit, was with a good grace and his delivery easy, natural and very solemn. He had not a strong, loud voice, but appeared with such gravity and solemnity and spake with such distinctness, clearness, and precision. His words were full of ideas set in such a plain and striking light that few speakers have been able to command the attention of an audience as he. His words often discovered a great deal of inward fervor without much noise or external emotion and fell with great weight upon the minds of his hearers. He made but little motion of his head or hands in the desk, but spake so as to discover the motion of his own heart, which tended in the most natural and effectual manner to move and affect others. Thus, Hopkins. The content of Edwards' sermons could be characterized 
as relentlessly logical. The outline was made visible to the mind's eye of his auditors through careful explanation and the sometimes elaborate use of headings and subheadings in order to break up the text as it was delivered. The structure of his sermon texts followed the Puritan scheme of three broad sections, text, doctrine, and application. The text was usually no more than a sentence or verse from which the doctrine was taken. It was stated as a sort of thesis for what followed. Then he usually set about as close and careful an analysis of the text as possible, giving particular emphasis upon the literary form of the passage and its propositional content. This part of the sermon was usually conceptually laden, with reference being made to larger systematic issues in which the particular text was situated. This, in turn, was improved, a Puritan term for the close pastoral application of the text. Puritan ministers were renowned for the forensic way in which they attempted to apply scripture to the lives of the congregation with considerable psychological insight and existential nuance. The section of the Puritan sermon concerned with such application was usually peppered with direct appeals to the listener. You need to do this. You are the one this passage is speaking of. Your situation is directly in view here and so on. Edward's work was representative of such sermons. These appeals, including the prophetic overtones of cajoling and upbraiding the congregation, as well as denouncing sin. But this was intermixed with appeals designed to soothe, restore, and encourage the burdened soul. The delivery of the sermon lasted at least an hour. It was not unheard of for a sermon to be double that length. I'm sure you're glad I won't be double that length today. In a sermon in which there were no radios, no televisions, and no computers, the preached word constituted the regular weekly public broadcasts. They were taken very seriously. And everyone in the town or village would have been expected to be present on a Sunday, even if they were not themselves professed believers or members of the church. The popular cameo of Edwards the scarecrow-like preacher is accurate as far as it goes. As was typical in the period, Edwards wore clerical garb in the pulpit, and he always preached from there. Speaking from a lectern, as I am today, would have been an almost unthinkable act of liturgical dereliction for a congregational minister of the period. These formal accoutrements were a fixture of his career, as was the liturgy in which the sermon was the climax. The colonial society in which Edwards lived was, after all, founded in order to be a place in which the plain style of reformed worship could flourish. His mode of preaching did change during his lifetime, however. He was influenced in midlife by the much more histrionic style of the Anglican itinerant George Whitfield, whom he befriended on his evangelistic tours of the eastern seaboard of what is today the United States. Whitfield visited Edwards on several occasions and preached in the Northampton pulpit that Edwards usually occupied. But Edwards was not a Whitfield, nor was he an aspiring Methodist. Whitfield was a born actor who honed his public speaking skills in open-air arenas, preaching extemporaneously for several hours and at times to crowds of thousands. By contrast, Edwards was a man of a scholarly disposition, and his pulpit habits betrayed the retired existence he lived. Unlike Whitfield, he never preached in the fields or byways, but only in the church of which he was a minister, or with some frequency as his fame spread, at the invitation of brother pastors in other townships. The settled order of of congregational New England was not something Edwards sought to overturn. In fact, for all his admiration of Whitfield's manner and attempt during the revivals of the Great Awakening to be more extemporary in his preaching, Edwards wasn't really at home in that more immediate mode of delivery. He did move from the full text sermons of his early ministry to the use of small flashcards that could be palmed for a more apparently natural delivery. But in later life, when important occasions arose, he still wrote out his sermons in full. It may be that Edwards felt his natural gifts were less effective or impressive than those of Whitfield, 
But it may also be that the pressure of constant work as a minister, as well as additional invitations elsewhere, meant that the more economical way of writing up his sermons was something of a practical necessity. Those who are involved in pastoral ministry here will probably have an inkling of what I'm talking about. Whatever the reason for the gradual change to the manner of his preaching, and these definite pressures are, of course, by no means mutually exclusive, the fact that he never felt entirely at home in the extemporary mode and that he returned to his more natural full-script full preaching at important moments in his later life are, I suggest, not insignificant. They indicate something important about the disposition of the man behind the text. Edwards was a preacher almost his entire adult life. He was a minister by profession, which meant that sermon preparation was one of the staples of his weekly routine. He preached weekly, twice on Sundays, as well as delivering midweek lectures, which were really disquisitions on some biblical text. When one adds up the amount of preparation and writing this involved, where Edwards was writing out his text in longhand, it's equivalent in literary output to the production of three book-length chapters a week, or an entire monograph in a month. That's a lot of writing. Such devotion to the preached word required a significant amount of routine study. As an, as an heir to the Puritan tradition of plain preaching and exegetical uh, analysis, um, Edwards thought the exposition of the text of Scripture one of the central tasks of the preacher. But he did not indulge in hand-waving or physical motions, he didn't think those were important in effective ministry, despite the obvious successful example of exactly that sort of delivery in what we might call the dramaturgy of Whitfield. In many ways, their two approaches to the delivery of sermons reflected their different ideas about the task of the preacher. Whitfield sought by use of his considerable oratorical gifts and a mellifluous and powerful voice to persuade his hearers. He was an evangelist through and through. Moral change was the desired outcome, and often this was accompanied by physical and emotional outpourings. He was a dramatic and arresting speaker who drew similarly dramatic and arresting responses from those who listened to him. Edwards was no mean preacher either, and on occasion his sermons elicited spectacular responses. The most celebrated example is the reaction to the second preaching of his Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God sermon at Enfield, where the congregation were grasping hold of the pillars of the church and wailing so loudly in fear of being cast immediately into hell that Edwards was actually unable to finish the sermon. But although he was an apologist for the revivals that swept through colonial New England, he didn't put much store by the physical or hysterical responses to his sermons. In fact, he thought these were no sure indicator of any real spiritual awakening. What was needed was a moral change wrought in the heart by the secret work of the Spirit of God. Only that was lasting, and only that would be of real benefit to his hearers. In the knowledge that preaching must convert the soul and equip the saints, Edwards directed his energies towards the goal of uncovering and laying bare ideas before the minds of his congregation in the full expectation that God would honor the preaching of his word by regenerating those appointed for salvation or encouraging and building up the faith of those already on their way to the internal city. This brings us to the rationale for preaching as Edwards understood it. Perhaps it comes as no surprise for someone who regarded himself as a representative of the Reformed tradition that Edwards had a very high view of those ordained to minister word and sacrament. Not only was the sermon the liturgical apogee of every Sunday service at which Edwards preached, in common with the established order of New England congregationalism, he clearly thought that preaching was his primary responsibility as a minister. More than a thousand of Edwards' sermons or sermon skeletons have been preserved and painstakingly transcribed in the modern edition of Edwards' works which you can find online at the Yale uh, Jonathan Edwards Center. We also have his numerous notebooks, including volumes devoted entirely to biblical exegesis and to harmonizing the two biblical testaments. Edwards even had in mind a work of systematic theology that would have been cast as a narrative 
which would have enabled him to set out the biblical story of salvation history. This work, incomplete at his death, was one of the great tasks to which he had hoped to devote his mature years. It supplanted an earlier project, uh, an earlier system of doctrine, that was to be called a rational account, which was more obviously a philosophical and apologetic work. To this end, he preached a series of sermons to his congregation at Northampton, a sort of first attempt at setting forth some of the ideas he hoped to develop in his larger project. These have subsequently been published as his History and Work of Redemption, a fascinating overview of the whole biblical drama. Evidence of Edwards' deep entanglement with scripture can also be found in his typological works. He wrote a great, great deal about the way in which the Old Testament prefigures the new in various types and shadows that are fulfilled in Christ. But he took this much further than some of his contemporaries, elaborating an entire system of signs in the created order which he thought could be decoded or understood through deep study of scripture. Some examples are fairly jejun, like the sun, its light, and its rays, as an image of the Trinity. Others are more complex, like his claim that the whole creation is a mere shadow of the spiritual world, which is infinitely more real than the one we inhabit. In his hands, the Bible was both a textbook for salvation and a grammar for understanding God's work in creation, as well as the source of great personal spiritual comfort and delight. All this is pertinent to the question of how Edwards thought about the nature and purpose of preaching, because it shows how deep and systematic his involvement with scripture actually was. His biblical interests bleed into every area of his thought, including his most abstruse philosophical theology. In light of this, it comes as no surprise that Edwards regarded the preaching of scripture as a task of fundamental importance. In an early entry in his miscellaneous notebook, he records how he thinks that preaching is really about power. And I quote it for you. He says this, Without doubt, ministers are to administer the sacraments to Christians and that they are to administer them only to such as they think Christ would have them administer them. Without doubt, ministers are to teach men what Christ would have them to do and to teach them who doth these things and who doth them not, that is, who are Christians and who are not, and that people are to hear them as much in this thing as in others, and that so far forth as the people are obliged to hear what I teach them, so great is my pastoral or ministerial or teaching power. And this is all the difference of power there is amongst ministers, whether apostles or whatever. Thus, if I in a right manner am become the teacher of a people, so far as they ought to hear what I teach them, so much power I have. And then warming to his theme, he goes on to say this. And if it was plain to all the world of Christians that I was under the infallible guidance of Christ, and that I was sent forth to teach the world the will of Christ, then I should have power in all the world. I should have power to teach them what they ought to do, and they would be obliged to hear me. I should have power to teach them who were Christians and who were not. And in this likewise, they would be obliged to hear me. Now, this passage appears to be an exercise in megalomania. And no doubt there is something of this present in the writing of the young Yale-educated minister. But what is just as interesting for our purposes is the way in which Edwards conceives of the task of the preacher. True preaching has to do with what we might call the rhetoric of power. That is, with words that change their hearers via the attending work of the Spirit of God. Head was, was certainly not of the view that sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never harm me. He believed that words have the power to save or to damn. If that's the case, then from a certain point of view, preachers of the gospel are the most powerful of people. For this reason, Edwards thought expository preaching was imperative, for the power of the preacher is derived from the authority upon which she or he preaches. To the extent that the preacher rightly divides the word of God, she or he delivers words of power that can be the means by which the eternal destiny of her or his auditors is secured. This is an important factor in rightly understanding Edwards' view of the nature of preaching. 
It's also borne out by his practice of reading his sermons and explains why it is that he was never really at home in the purely extemporary style, such as that which marked Whitfield's ministry. As John E. Smith puts it in his reflections upon Edward's homiletics, and I quote him, it's not surprising to find that by all accounts Edward's talents were far more literary than oratorical. His weak points appear to have been in voice, gesture, and rhythm. His great power was his masterful use of language. Thus, Smith. Edwards played to his strengths as a scholar-pastor. But his method was not driven by pragmatic concerns about his own limitations as a preacher, but by his views about the nature of the homiletical task. Edwards' idea of the nature of preaching was very much a logocentric or word-oriented approach which elevated the rhetorical component of preaching over other more pragmatic, or practical, or dramaturgical aspects, such as bodily gesture or emotional response. The effect of this approach to preaching, the effects were significant. One example comes from the reminiscence of Dr. West of Stockbridge, whom Edward's early biographer, Sereno Dwight, quotes to the, following, to the following effect, and this is what he says. On one occasion, when the sermon exceeded two hours in length, he told me that from the time Mr. Edwards had fairly unfolded his subject, the attention of the audience was fixed and motionless for two hours until his close, when they seemed disappointed that it should terminate so soon. There was, this is the important bit, there was such a bearing down of truth upon the mind, he observed, that there was no denying it. Close quote. The rhetorical tone reported here is unmistakable. But Edward's analysis of the nature of preaching didn't stop there. He had views about how rhetorical power could be maximized based upon his analysis of preaching as laying bare the idea one wanted to convey to one's listeners. This notion of laying bare the idea was something Edwards learned from his reading of the English philosopher John Locke. Famously, Locke had defined ideas as whatsoever the mind perceives in itself or is the immediate object of perception, thought, or understanding. That's what Locke says. In one respect, Edwards took hold of Locke's definition and applied it to homiletics. This can be seen early on in his intellectual development in what's called his cover leaf memoranda to his notebook Natural Philosophy, one of his early notebooks in which Edwards writes the following. When I would prove anything, to take special care that the matter be so stated that it shall be seen most clearly and distinctly by everyone just how much I would prove. And so to extricate all questions from the least confusion or ambiguity of words is the important bit, so that the ideas shall be left naked. Great turn of phrase. The Harvard historian Perry Miller thought this an important indication of what he calls Edward's rhetoric of sensation, according to which ideas were not merely concepts, but the vehicles of emotion used by Edwards to galvanize and reorientate his congregation. But to my mind, that can't be right. Edwards wrote about religious affections, not religious emotions. The two aren't synonyms in his way of thinking. Whereas emotions can be thought of as equivalent to mere passions to which we are subject, affections have to do with the apprehension of a thing, the response of the self to an idea, as Edwards puts it. In other words, unlike emotions, affections involve the understanding. An effective knowledge of a thing involves acquaintance with that thing. It requires experience of that thing as well as comprehension of it. Edwards maintained that the believer is given a new sense of things in conversion, including what he called a new simple idea of his or her relationship to God. The preaching of scripture is what activates this in the believer. It is what brings about a moral reorientation of the sinner. Edwards writes this. Something is perceived by a true saint in the exercise of this new sense of mind in spiritual and divine things, as entirely diverse from anything that is perceived in them by natural men, as the sweet taste of honey is diverse from the ideas men get of honey by only looking on it 
and feeling of it. Edwards's desire to reach his congregation with homiletical power meant that he made a concerted effort to craft sermons that would be affecting. And since by his own lights affections were roused when a person apprehended an idea, it was only natural for him to think that he ought to spend his sermons laying bare those ideas, making them as clear as possible, so as to be as transparent a vehicle for the susurrations of the Holy Ghost as he could make them. As he says in some thoughts concerning the present revival of religion, one of his uh, works concerning the uh, early awakenings in New England, I think an exceedingly affectionate way of preaching about the great things of religion has itself no tendency to beget false apprehensions of them, but on the contrary, a much greater tendency to beget true apprehensions of them than a moderate, dull, indifferent way of speaking of them. I should think myself in the way of my duty to raise the affections of my hearers as highly as I possibly can, provided that they are affected with nothing but truth and with affections that are not disagreeable to the nature of what they are affected with. Our people don't so much need to have their heads stored as to have their hearts touched. And they stand in the greatest need of that sort of preaching that has the greatest tendency to do this says Edwards. Edwards published only one series of sermons in his lifetime, which may be surprising, under the rather prosaic title Discourses on Various Important Subjects, which is a typical 18th century title. It tells you nothing about what they're really about. They were prepared for the press at the behest of his congregation as a sort of memorial to the recent spiritual awakening which was already receding into the past by the time they were printed. Taken from the 1740s, the period in which he was most active as a minister, they comprise an interesting set of what we might think of as polished Edwardsian gems. In the preface of those sermons, Edwards offers some comment on the style of the sermons that have an important bearing upon his views about the nature and purpose of the sermon form. In reflecting on the complexities involved in one of the sermons on justification by faith, he writes that divines that have championed this doctrine have been criticized by fashionable 18th century theologians who argue that the classical doctrine is encumbered by speculative niceties and subtle distinctions which only serve the cause of further dispute. Against such work, these early modern theologians had set up a much more plain, easy, and natural account of things, he says. But to these critics, Edwards has a, has a ready answer. Many, he says, are ready to start start at anything that looks like nice distinction and to condemn it for nonsense without examination. But, observes Edwards, with more than a hint of sarcasm, upon the same subject, or upon the same account rather, we might expect to have St. Paul's epistles that are very full of nice distinctions called nonsense and unintelligible jargon, had not they the good luck to be universally received by all Christians as part of Holy Scriptures. Logical rigor, even hard concepts carefully explained, are not things Edwards thought should be absent from a well-formed sermon. Progress in the Christian faith implies progress in our knowledge of God, so it's important from an Edwardsian point of view that the minister feed her or his flock with expos expository material that helps the more advanced as well as the immature. He goes on to offer this comment in one of the sermons he prepared for the press. Again, I'm going to quote him. If the distinctions I have made use of in handling this subject are found to be inconsistent, trivial, and unscriptural niceties, tending only to cloud the subject, I ought to be willing that they should be rejected. But if on due examination they are found both scriptural and rational, I humbly concede that it would be unjust to condemn them, merely because they are, these are distinctions under a notion that niceness in divinity never helps it, but always perplexes and darkens it. Close quote. In a veiled attack upon the modern divines to which he referred earlier in the preface, Edwards explains that he has adopted a plain and unfashionable way of preaching, the fruits of which have been blessed in the awakening. Although he appears to worry about the lack of such ornaments as politeness and modishness of style and method, that his sermons display, 
It is clear from the context that Edwards is criticizing his opponents, not apologizing for the plain manner of his own preaching. Let us take stock. Edwards thinks that the preacher really concerned to effectively communicate to his congregation will endeavor to speak clearly, plainly, without ornament, without artifice, and without ostentatious display of his or her learning. The pulpit is not the place for polite or fashionable ideas. It is the place at which God's word is declared. For this reason, sermons should be clear, well-formed, and where it is possible, simple and to the point. This does not necessarily mean that sermons should avoid difficult or convoluted doctrine, however. Edwards is clear that good preaching involves attending to the different needs of one's hearers, ensuring that those who have made some progress in the faith are ministered to as much as those who are just starting out. Presumably, he would not be a fan of the modern development of so-called seeker-style preaching, in which the gospel is simply declared every week and no attempt is made to develop or improve the great doctrines of the Christian faith through systematic exposition. Rather, Edwards is of the view that the pastor has a responsibility to equip the saints through teaching them the whole counsel of God, even when that involves hard or complex material of the sort Edwards covers in his sermon, Justification by Faith. We've also seen that Edwards conceives of the sermon as an exercise in rhetorical power, or what Perry Miller calls the rhetoric of sensation. Such power is achieved through the clear presentation of the ideas that lie behind the passages of Scripture that are preached. This is Edwards' debt to Locke, although his semi-technical use of the category of ideas is more ontological than epistemological, that is, has more to do with the uncovering of how things are, rather than what we know, although progress and knowledge can, of course, lead to the uncovering of how things are. The aim in laying bare the ideas of Scripture is to affect those who hear the sermon so as to bring about a complete moral reorientation, in the case of those who are unconverted, and the introduction, via divine grace, of a new simple idea by means of which the regenerate are able to see things in a whole new light from a God's eye point of view. Those who are already, unbe- who are already believers rather, may also benefit from uh, such affecting doctrine in their encouragement and progress in understanding the faith. Little wonder that Edwards thought of the sermon as what I have called a logocentric or word-centered sort of thing. However, his approach to homiletics is not without its shortcomings, and there are important ways in which the retrieval of what Edwards says about preaching must be tempered for a very different contemporary context. There are several obvious ways in which how Edwards approached his preaching differs significantly from his modern counterparts. For one thing, the length and doctrinal complexity of his sermons would simply be practically impossible in a modern context. This is not simply because in a world of instant telecommunication, where people are bombarded with media of many different kinds on a daily basis, it would be unwise to presume that many congregations would tolerate a theological disquisition of this duration on a regular basis. A more fundamental gulf that separates Edwards from modern congregations has to do with the fact that his was a world saturated with biblical language and idioms where his hearers had developed a tolerance, even a delight in, the sermon. Harriet Beecher Stowe, a product of the New England formed by the theology of Edwards and his disciples, immortalized this culture in her novels. She writes this, Never was there a community where the roots of common life were shot down so deeply and were so intensely grappling around the the, the things sublime and eternal. The intricate metaphysical system of theologians like Edwards and his disciples that that were built in their studies and then preached from their pulpits were, she says, and here I quote her again, discussed by every farmer in intervals of plough and hoe, by every woman and girl at loom, spinning wheel and wash tub. New England was one vast sea surging from depth to height with thought and discussion on the most insoluble of of mysteries. And it is to be added that no man or woman has accepted any theory or speculation simply as a theory or speculation. All was profoundly real and vital, a foundation on which actual life was based with intensest earnestness. That's what she says. She says, 
But clearly, this is a far cry from the culture that has formed congregations in the complex liberal democracies of the modern Western world. Retrieving Edwardsian principles for contemporary preaching must begin by acknowledging this gulf. More may be tempted by the retired scholarly life that Edwards adopted in order to preach effectively. He was reported by uh, Samuel Hopkins to be a student for 13 hours of the day, to spend 13 hours of the day in his study, and many of his uh, immediate disciples carried this tradition on in the New England theology. This is much to commend it, but it comes at considerable cost, a cost most modern preachers will find too great. Edwards was a singular individual, but his life of almost monastic retirement did not help him to be an effective pastor. After all the revivals in Northampton, he was ejected from his living and spent the last years of his life as a missionary on the frontier. At least part of the problem, though by no means the whole of it, was his failure to attend to aspects of his vocation other than scholarship. Finally, even if we balk at the extent to which Edwards' conception of preaching is logocentric, or worried that a sermon that is read is no sermon at all, there is much to commend ideas, uh, Edwards' idea of preaching as the rhetoric of sensation, aimed at laying bare the ideas of Scripture in order to affect those that hear it. Here, too, he seeks to transcend what is often and mistakenly perceived to be a disjunction with which the preacher is faced, either an affecting, or at worst, an emotionally appealing sermon, or a reasoned discourse. According to Edwards, rightly dividing the word of God requires both. Thank you. Well, it's a, a great joy and privilege uh, to be with you today. And uh, I've almost dried off. Uh, from the rain outside, and I hope you have as well. I'd like to start by thanking Dr. Crisp for his excellent paper and uh, for the many important insights uh, that his work in theology, both in the UK uh, and uh, at Fuller now, have brought and are bringing to the table. I was thrilled listening uh, to the paper uh, right now, and I hope you understand the significance of some of the insights you just heard delivered. Uh, given that we both hail from the motherland, I, I should also mention for the audience that this is actually the first time we've met, though we realized that we spoke on the phone uh, some years ago. So we're, we're catching up in another regard. And uh, I'm delighted for the opportunity now to interact on these significant matters uh, that you've heard so expertly articulated. I'd also like to take a moment to thank uh, Dr. Sweeney uh, for his vision behind the Jonathan Edwards Center at Trinity and his heart for the involvement of the church in the academy. Now, Jonathan Edwards is a towering figure in the history of the church, and it's a great joy to see uh, uh, Dr. Sweeney, your vision behind the center coming to such an important fruition, and uh, for pastors like myself to be uh, engaging with academics around the matter of the gospel and theology uh, by means of the works of uh, Jonathan Edwards. I've known uh, Dr. Sweeney for a number of years now, all the way back to my time at Yale when I was working on the Edwards Manuscripts, and uh, I was thrilled to hear this uh, initiative at the center and with this lecture series. Now, when I uh, read Dr. Chris's work as it was sent to me ahead of time, and now when I uh, hear it delivered live, I was struck by the significance of Edwards' vision for content not form. Now clearly Edwards took great pains with the precision of his choice of words. But most observers seem to agree that Edwards was not marked out as a preacher by a special oratorical gifts or flourishes or panache. So when Dr. Crisp uh, compared Edwards in this regard to George Whitfield, the comparison is really quite, uh, quite uh, stark, isn't it? Whitfield, for whom uh, he would regularly take on the persona of biblical characters he described. Uh, he would become David in acting uh, form for his hearers, or act out the part of a judge when he described the last judgment. 
and other such dramatic personas, that was quite a different kind of preacher. Both shared a broadly similar theology and a similar emphasis upon regeneration and a joint concern to foster and further revival. But the techniques of preaching were quite different. Another comparison springs uh, to my mind of a non-contemporaneous figure, and that of uh, Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon, though himself a settled minister, not a traveling evangelist like Whitfield, uh, so he didn't have the uh, freedom to preach the same sermon in different contexts over and over again. Um, uh, Spurgeon was also known, though, not just for the precision of his words, uh, but for his uh, method of delivery of those words. One famous story has him checking the acoustics of a large building in which he was due to preach, saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. And then he found out some years later that one of the cleaners in the building was converted as he, uh, as he said that. Now, now, what are we to make of uh, these differences of emphases uh, with regard to the techniques of preaching. Are they a matter of personality entirely? Um, of legitimate range of gifting? Or is there a particular ideal type? And uh, if not, are there ranges of ideal within legitimate personality differences? Perhaps there are specific dangers acutely relevant for particular kinds of preachers, uh, those not likely to be faced by other kinds of preachers. Uh, we know, as uh, Dr. Chris explained for us, that uh, Edwards at one point in his ministry would palm his sermons so that the tiny writing on the little booklets that he had sewn together could fit snugly in his hand, allowing him to look the congregation at least sometimes in the eye a bit like an 18th century version of a teleprompt, perhaps. Uh, later on in his life, some of the sermon manuscripts, written in a less precise hand, have uh, dashes that come after their theological words, as if either he had become so used to explaining, say, regeneration, that writing it all out again by hand was almost unnecessary in certain circumstances for him anymore, or that given uh, in those occasions he was speaking to a less theologically formed society uh, in Stockbridge, that precision perhaps he felt was less needed and a more homely conversational approach was legitimate then. I suppose some of these things by the nature of the historical inquiry may never be entirely um, known. Now, I've been asked as part of my uh, brief to reflect on how these matters may apply to the work of the pastorate, and particularly, I suppose today, the preachers in our churches right now. It seems to me that Edwards encourages preachers to be majestically careful with the text and ministerially particular with the application of the text. So the Bible breathes through Edwards' written sermons as if you are rehearing the text creatively and imaginatively, constantly applied. Plus, Edwards uh, used picture language frequently in the midst of his sentences, so they come to life. I uh, once actually uh, read out uh, word for word uh, that famous sinners in the hands of an angry God sermon. I read it out word for word to a congregation. Um, I introduced it with a simple sentence of historical context. Uh, then said I would read out the manuscript as it stood before me with no further additions or explanations. And it was striking for me to hear the almost pin drop silence. 18th century text. There is an intensity to encountering God in the middle of the text. The sheer scale of Edwards' God makes flippant foppery in the congregation die away. 
I think there are two aspects of Edwards' theory of preaching that helps us grasp this effect in this regard. One is the fear that Edwards had no qualms about seeking to introduce. And I say this perhaps to my discredit as much to, as anyone else's, but I have not heard in my life a sermon that is as unabashed about preaching the fear of hell or judgment as one quarter of one sermon of Edwards's. Now, we may feel Edwards went too far with almost Dante-like imagery at times, but the fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom, is, I suspect, also the beginning of compelling preaching. Otherwise, inevitably, we are competing with the most imaginative and creative communication means in our media-saturated society, and inevitably, we will lose. But there is no drama higher than hearing an ashen-faced president announce a bombing, a building collapsing, a judgment to come. The other element is sweeter. Edwards also intended to help us as hearers hear, as his viewers see, as his uh, interlocutors taste the living God. This goes back to his dalliance with Lockean ideology, his concept of the idea, which he wished to strip bare by words so that the sheer weight of the idea could be reverberating with crystal clarity in the hearer's minds. And his concept of the sense of the heart, the new taste that he wished his hearers to have. This preaching to the affections uh, is... Uh, distinct from appealing to the whims or the tastes of the hearers. We often appeal to their tastes. Edwards wanted to have them taste the sweetness of the divine honey. So I've been reflecting as I read Dr. Crisp's uh, paper earlier and as I uh, listened again uh, just now uh, about our training uh, that we do at uh, College Church. We, we train four budding pastor preachers as full-time members of the staff there at any one time. And part of that training is systematic instruction, opportunity to handle the text to write and to grasp its main point and meaning. Uh, uh, but I wonder whether, listening to Dr. Crisp, we also need to introduce an element whereby we're training ourselves to not only handle the text right, but to do it in such a way that uh, the presence of the living God is felt, tasted, heard, quaked before, and rejoiced over. as well. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, we do want to have a time of questions and answers and discussion with all of you. Uh, I, I think Dan's ready to walk a microphone around so that when you have a question, we can get it recorded. Uh, Oliver, Josh, do you mind coming back up here again with me so that we can feature the two of you in the conversation here? Uh, maybe as people are thinking about possible questions, uh, Oliver, we can ask if there's anything that Josh said that you'd like to say a word or two about. Um, I, I mean, uh, apart from saying amen to me, no, I, I, I very much appreciated the, the uh, comments that um, Joshua made, and I think um, he really got a, a lot of what I was trying to get across in terms of um, what it seems to me uh, ought to be. I mean, in a sense, I, and, I, and this probably came across from what I was saying, um, I'm very sympathetic to the, the kind of main thrust of what Edward says about the nature of preaching, and it seems to me that preaching ought to be about the content, the material content, what trying to get across, and that the, 
things that perhaps too often we, we spend more time focusing on, the more outward and showy aspects are really not as in, anywhere near as important as, as getting to the heart of the matter in a careful and precise manner if we're really handling the words of God. And I think Ed was, was someone who understood that. And I think sometimes in our tele, television, telecultural, internet age, we are in danger of losing that. So I, I very much appreciate those comments from someone who's a working minister. Yeah, I always enjoy reading Edward's sermons because he paid such close attention to the word of God. He paid such close attention to words that his sermons have a kind of a verbal power mm. that both of you have spoken about and that um, I, I find myself enthralled by, you know, as I read his sermons. Yeah. I think I, like Edwards, am a bookish, introverted sort of a person. So I'm always interested in these discussions we have today in homiletical circles about uh, personality in preaching. Mm -hmm. I always feel like people with bigger personalities like mine mm -hmm. are better examples of personality in preaching, you know, than yeah. more introverted folks might be. And then there's these other conversations these days about um, the leadership styles of introverts, you know, and then I wonder about people like Edward sometimes uh, when, I, when I hear about these conversations because I feel like an oddball sometimes for, for enjoying mm -hmm. the verbal element of Edward's sermons mm -hmm. quite as much as I do. Yeah. And I honestly wonder how, to, to what an extent I ought to commend that style of preaching to seminary students today. You know, as you pointed out, there's such a gap between Edward's culture and ours. Mm -hmm. Ours, by comparison, is so much more saturated with uh, sensational media and sound bites and so on. I, you know, I wonder um, what do you think and maybe what does Pastor Moody think because mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe your personality is similar to mine and yet you've had a wonderful preaching ministry for many years now. What is the potential for an Edward style preacher in 21st century America? To what degree do we really want to commend this versus to what degree do we want to point out as Dr. Crisp did, the cultural gap is so large that we'd be foolish to try to simply replicate the sort of preaching that Edwards exhibits for us. Maybe, Josh, would you mind speaking sure. to that briefly? Yeah, uh, I think you need to do both. I think you, you, you need to commend uh, the principle of expositing the text mm -hmm. and being careful with the word and with words, but you also need to underline the cultural difference. Mm -hmm. So, um, whereas Edwards was preaching to a culture that was extremely familiar with the Bible and um, was very religious, mm -hmm. we're preaching to a culture whereby um, people are much less familiar with the Bible. Uh, and so, preachers today have to uh, be more missional in their understanding. They have to know what's going on in culture. So application has a worldview kind of application. It's not just, you know, uh, read the Bible a bit more. It's, it's apologetic. It, it, it's um, um, how this world intersects with the world in which people live. So I think, I think you need to do both. You need to say, yeah, there's something very important and um, helpful that we can discover in Edwards. On the other hand, um, when we train our guys and when I preach, I don't try and preach like Edwards in the sense of, you know, standing rigidly and staring at the, uh, at the bell rope until it stares, you know, falls off and, and all that. Um, I, I'm quite willing to tell a story. Um, I want to tell the story, most of all. Um, and the kind of application I will do won't be won't sound like it's drawn straight from a you know 18th century textbook. And so I won't only read Puritans. I think if you if you as a pastor if you just read Puritans you end up sounding like a Puritan. Mm. There's one thing to have Puritan theology. It's another thing to preach sounding like a Puritan. That's probably not a good idea. Um, you know, so you can have Puritan theology but preach in contemporary terms. That's, that's, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Anything that you want to add on this? I was just going to say, I think um, one of the things that Edwards does think about that perhaps we do, we do need to recover, although I, I have to agree with everything that Josh has said there, um, is this uh, 
the way in which we tend to distinguish between the head and the heart. You know, so you might have someone who's preaching, you know, seeks to elicit an emotional response, the heart. We might have other people whose approach, is more, whose approach is more intellectual, and that's the preaching of the head. And then you might say, well, you know, I, I'm just the kind of person who's more interested in one or the other. Um, and you might want to place Edwards on, on the head rather than heart side of things. But I think one of the important things that Edwards shows us is that that's a mistaken bifurcation, that it's not a question of head or heart, but there's got to be some way of speaking to people that brings both of those things together. And I think this notion of affections, which he does a lot with in his religious affections and thinks a lot about in his homiletics, is of vital importance in rightly understanding what Edwards is doing, that although I described what he was saying as what his approach rather was kind of a logocentric word center, it's not in order to merely communicate information it's in order to set the heart aflame. And I think if we don't see that in Edwards, and we, and we don't sort of pay attention to what Edwards is saying in that regard, then the worry is that we, we are left with this, um, this disjunction, which I think is a very unhelpful way of thinking about the nature of the preaching task. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? JK. Yeah, for, uh, for, for either of you. Um, in light of the uh, descri describing of Edwards' uh, proclamation of the word as being emphasized in terms of uh, being felt, uh, heard, and tasted, or that idea, what role did the sacraments play liturgically in the, in the uh, Sunday service in, um, alongside the word proclaimed? What role what, did they play for Edwards? What, yeah, in, in, Ed in Edwards' view and in Edwards' practice, how did he, how did he uh, invoke and utilize the sacraments um, in complement to the proclaimed word? Good question. He was embroiled, uh, amongst other things, at the end of his career in a controversy about the Eucharist, communion controversy, because he inherited a practice from his maternal grandfather, who he succeeded in the pulpit in Northampton, Solomon Stoddard, uh, which, at the end of his ministry, he... Uh, tries to overturn, and this precipitated um, his uh, eventual dismissal from, from Northampton. Um, so whereas Solomon Stoddard thought of the Eucharist as a converting ordinance, it could be something that could be used in order to bring to faith people who may have been adherents of the church, people who are regular attenders, but not in full standing as members of the church, who hadn't made a profession of faith uh, in quite, quite the way that would, uh, they would have needed to become full members. Um, Edwards, he says, came to see that that was a mistake and that the table should be fenced. In other words, that the table should only be uh, somewhere where believers were admitted or those who could give an, an adequate profession of faith, I suppose. Um, so he certainly is mixed up with controversy on how to administer communion I'm not sure to what extent he had written, maybe the others who can help me, had written about the relationship between communion, the, you know, communion, i.e. the Eucharist, and preaching, um, or indeed bat baptism and preaching. Um, but he certainly did think, he certainly thought some length about the place of the Eucharist and its importance liturgically. But I defer to my colleagues here. I can add just a little bit of social history here. Um, Edwards did not write uh, an essay or a treatise about either the Eucharist or baptism. Right. So there's not a lot of theology to go on. But during the revival, Edwards does write in some of his uh, revival era writings that even though for most of his ministry in Northampton, the church celebrated the Lord's Supper only about once every other month, yeah. his preference was for weekly celebration because he thought that the Lord's Supper was such a vivid, tangible sign of gospel truth. He did see it as something that really could complement the ministry of the word in a powerful way. And he never succeeded in getting weekly communion at his church, but he did favor it. Yeah. Yeah, he was a, yeah. He was reacting against Stoddard, his communion controversy, and he was in some ways quite a traditional, that's the sense you get, he was, in that regard, he was quite a traditional Calvinist, I think. His high, high view of the sacraments, but word-centered, and not seeing those two as at war with each other because the, the, the sacraments are pointing to the word. 
mm-hmm. that would be the traditional mm-hmm. formulation. But he, yeah, he didn't. The communion controversy is the only mm-hmm. time he interacted with it, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Any other questions or comments? Tim has one. I'm kind of wondering if there was a format that he had. I've heard of some pastors today that say they use Sunday as like the entry point for non-believers to come in here, just basic messages, and then throughout the course of the week there might be more deep uh, truths taught. Did Edwards have a, a format for how he brought new believers in, or was it pretty much Sunday was the same for non-believers and believers? Yeah, again, I don't know who wants to should I jump in. Do you want to jump in first? I mean, again, you have to kind of think of a very different world. So um, I think you said, you know, everyone in the, in, the, in, the, in the town was expected to go to church, whether they were converted communicant members or not. And so when you read Edwards' sermons, I, I anyway, it'd be interesting to discuss this, but I anyway get the impression that he's fully aware that there are people in the congregation who he doesn't think are Christians. I think he's always doing a both ends. And that discussion that's going on right now, whereas, you know, are, are you preaching on Sunday for Christians or for non-Christians, right? I think Edwards, though it's a very different world, so he's not trying to sort of reach out to the unchurched because everyone is churched. Um, but in principle, he's doing both ends. And he'll appeal in, in his application points and his improvement to the unconverted as well as the converted. It's pretty obvious, I think, that he's got both those things in his mind. I mean, I think the, the cultural gap that Josh speaks of is a very significant one. I mean, I think the nearest analog I've come across to something like uh, 18th century New England church life is in the, uh, in the Hebridean Islands in Scotland, where you've still got, in places like Lewis and Harris, you've still got a society that's in very significant ways formed by a Christian worldview. And even if someone doesn't go to church, they know about the Christian faith, and not just superficially. Um, And in that kind of context, you have a clear distinction between between people who are church members, in other words, people who are communicating members of the church, and they only have communion twice a year, once or twice a year, they have communion seasons, and people who are called adherents of the church, that is, people who might be regular attenders of the church but have not made a profession of faith. And in that kind of context... Uh, although you don't have 100% church attendance, uh, you have a much higher percentage of attendance from the, from the local community. Now, that seems to me a lot closer to the sort of situation that Edwards is working with, so that the idea that you might, on a Sunday, be speaking specifically to people who are unchurched, have no notion of the gospel, that you're preaching to for the first time about who Christ is and stuff like that, there's just no analog to that in his culture. There just weren't such people around. So, in a sense, I think it's, it's artificial and anachronistic to try and take Edwards and what he does and, and put it down wholesale into the current sort of situations in which many ministers find themselves, particularly in places like large urban settings. There are significant differences. That said, I do think that, uh, I, my guess anyway, is that Edwards would have felt that the idea that you preach to two different sorts of people like that would be um, an unhelpful way of trying to, in some way, traduce what the gospel can do to any given mixed multitude of people. So I think he would have felt that uh, one ought as a minister to seek to speak to both the converted and the unconverted in a given context. But I think there are very significant differences. Yeah, I was hoping you could just... um Maybe speak for Edwards, if that's possible. <laughs> um, if if proclamation, proclamation and exegesis are important to preaching, or if they're the totality of preaching, what else can you add to exegesis and, and proclamation, or should you add? Maybe how would Edwards feel about that? What else is there? That's a genuine question. What else would there be apart from... Explaining the text and proclaiming the text. Maybe like doctrine, if you were to separate those two, application, obviously you can put those with the text, but... Yeah, I don't think he would have recognized that you could really do that. That's why uh, he follows the Puritan form of sermon of text, doctrine, and application. I think um, 
the way he preaches is pretty much always on the base of a text that leads to doctrine and then is applied. Um, although I, it might be worth saying this, I mean, I, I suppose when he speaks of, or, or yeah, speaks in terms of expositional preaching, it's maybe slightly different from some modern forms of expositional preaching in this respect, that it's usually just a sentence or a verse, right? And it's, it's a bit more like, I don't know if any of you know the, the British preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Martin Lloyd-Jones used to preach a bit like that. You'd get one, te one sentence from the Book of Romans, and he would preach on that. And so he'd work his way through the Book of Romans. It'd take him years to do so, because he was just doing one sentence or one verse at a time. There's something like that in, in Edwards' preaching. And in fact, he's got entire sermon series like Charity and its Fruits, which is just about one, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, one passage of Scripture, right? Um, so he doesn't find that at all problematic. Um, I wonder whether that would be different and I imagine it probably would be different in some important respects from the way that perhaps we moderns might think about expositional preaching, where you might want to set a verse in the context of a larger passage or a larger pericopi or a larger block of teaching in, in, a, in a particular uh, book of scripture. He doesn't tend to do that quite so much, I think. I wonder if this is a place where we could talk a little bit more about the potential uh, of the application of a sermon. Yeah. I mean, you, you highlighted the importance of application to people like Edwards. Uh, we've talked you know, in classes here at Trinity, and people who write about Edwards note this from time to time, that the Puritans, including late people like Edwards, coached one another to spend about half of the sermon right. on application. Yeah. And I wonder, uh, Dr. Crisp, as a theologian, have you ever thought about the theological potential of emphasizing the application of Scripture doctrine with that kind of um, seriousness and with that kind of even uh, scientific precision that you find sometimes in Edwards? And I wonder, you know, Pastor Moody, have you, I mean, if the answer is no, then it's fine and we just be <laughs> short, but have you ever thought about or have you learned anything from the Puritans or from Edwards when it comes to applying scripture doctrine in your own sermons? Do you want to go first? I don't know. I can't. Um, okay. Uh, I have thought. I actually went through a little phase in my preaching when I tried to follow the Puritan, you know, text doctrine application, and um, I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so in that regard, I probably haven't copied it. But I, what what I have noticed is that, and this speaks to the expositional question and connection, doesn't it? What, what I have noticed is their commitment to God's truth, God's word being applicable. Mm. Whereas we tend to, today there's this, some, in some circles, and these words are used in so many different ways in different circles today, but in some circles exegesis, exposition almost means a kind of commentary mm. on the Bible from the pulpit without any real relevance to anyone who's actually there. Mm. Well that's mm. totally different from the Puritan attitude. The Puritan attitude is when you exposit scripture, it speaks powerfully to the people in front of you. So in some ways, they are the friends of heavy application in their understanding of exposition. And so because of that, I think of my preaching as interweaving those two elements all the time. Good. Yeah, I mean, I, I would wholeheartedly endorse that. I, mean, I, I I've been a minister myself, and um, I must say I was influenced in the way I sought, uh, the way I still do seek to preach um, in giving a lot of time to trying to improve the text, as Edwards would say. Um, I think it's vital. I really do. I think it's absolutely vital um, to uh, good preaching that the text is made up to come alive for the congregation. You, you can't just simply say, well, this is what the text means. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning. Um, you've got to, it seems to me anyway, you've got to really bring that text to bear on the particularities that, are, that the congregation's facing, and that might be different congregation to congregation. I think that's something that the Puritans and Edwards in particular have got to teach us today, is a, is a kind of recovery of 
the kind of forensic application that they specialized in, mm -hmm. which wasn't the kind of general platitudes about, you know, you might be a mother at home and such and such be the case, you might be a student at school and such and such be the case, but really analyzing this text is speaking to this specific kind of person in this congregation in the following way. Um, and maybe we need to, to recover that, be less afraid of the text in that respect, and let it, let it um, speak to us in a, in a more um, directly applied manner, I guess. Yeah. Does that require more courage than most pastors have, as you say? I mean, what, because to, do, to, to unleash the text like that and, and work hard yeah. at applying it directly in, in, in the lives of people you know, whose struggles you know, yeah. whose sin problems you know, uh, you, you run the risk of offending. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, yeah, I mean, I think, may, uh, I think it requires the right kind of model in your mm -hmm. mind. So I, I think there is a bifurcation between emotion and reason. I think there's a bifurcation also between expository preaching and being relevant. You know, yeah. and there are different ways that people try to bridge that gap. But if if we believe as Christians that God's word is God speaking, <laughs> then we don't have to make it relevant, or but we should expose it as relevant. I don't know what maybe it takes courage. I guess it does, but I think I think there's a there's a model issue. People don't expect exegesis to mean that, and so when they're told you must preach expositorily, they're thinking, well, people are no longer going to feel it's relevant. That's what's going on in people's heads. Yeah. Whereas actually, if Edwards is right, as I think you know, as the Bible claims, if you preach God's word, it is relevant, and in fact, it'll be far more relevant than any number of you know, trendy topical sermons I can think of. Yeah. Because then I'm thinking, now I'm thinking what God thinks about us. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think Professor Hedges had a question. Yes, my question was along those same lines, and maybe you will feel you've spoken enough to this, but I was wondering as you were talking whether Edward's concept of exposition, exposing, laying bare this truth, and letting, having the people confront it in its own power is inherently confrontational. Because it strikes me that a lot of contemporary preaching strives very hard to avoid confrontation. Yeah. And uh, so I'm just curious as to whether you think it, in his view, it has to be sinners in the hands of an angry God, obviously, <laughs> is on so many levels confrontational. Yeah. But I don't know Edward's other sermons, so I don't know if, that, if, if that's characteristic or not. Yeah, I mean, I think he probably, I think his, if you read his sermons, it doesn't take long wherever you start in the sermon corpus before you see that the way that he applies doctrines does make you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, for someone like Edwards, if it doesn't make you uncomfortable, and in, in some respects anyway, uh, he's not doing his job properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a significant, probably a significant difference between then and now, in, in as much as we tend not to populate churches that make us feel uncomfortable every time we listen to a sermon. I think that's a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think um, I think uh, some of that goes back to Edwards' um, weaknesses too, in that he, I think if you're going to develop that kind of ministry, especially today and even in his day, it's important to develop um, personal mm -hmm. connections mm -hmm. so, that, so that when you're in the pulpit, they know you're in the pulpit. But then you're sitting at their sick bed, and you're still the same person, but, but they understand that you're under the word as well, relationally. Uh, and that's harder in different contexts, depending on the size of the church, but at least have some people who actually know you. Um, I think the other thing is that um, when, it, when it's done well, um, and you see that often in Edward's sermons, when it's done well, the kind of confrontation that it produces is something you're grateful for. So it's not, um, I don't like you, let me tell you some home truths, right? It's, um, I love you, and uh, now, these are some things that we should think about. And it feels more like uh, you're going to your um, physician for your annual checkup, and you know him well, and he's saying, let's just check your heart, and, okay, you maybe need to cut back a bit on your cholesterol, it's not offensive. You're just, you're glad that he knows what he's doing, and he's giving you some help, do you know what I mean? So I think when it's done well, actually confrontation avoids conflict. 
because you're now confronting face to face. Let's, let's really talk about some serious things. And you can do it with a joyful, a joyful severity. So some of Edwards' sermons, some of them are these sort of hellfire brimstone sermons, but some of them more like charity and fruit sermons, yeah, where yeah. you come away feeling just sort of bathed yeah. in love. That's a different kind of confrontation. Now I need to actually be humble enough to accept that God actually loves me. Now that's confronting my pride, but it's confronting my pride not by the tool of, of aggression, but by the tool of sweetness. So I, th- I think you do see both those things in Edwards' sermons. There's the fear one, which shocks us because we don't hear that. We're not used to the Jeremiah tradition. And so that tends to stick out because we're so unused to it. But there's also a lot of the sweetness uh, as well. Uh, may I just say one more thing on that? Uh, just this, I, I worry a little bit sometimes about a kind of evangelical... Um, canonization of Edwards, you know, that he becomes a kind of alabaster saint, yeah. as if he can do nothing wrong. And in connection with uh, what Josh has just said, I mean, I think, it seems to me anyway that one of the, one of the significant problems Edwards had as a minister is that um, he wasn't someone who was um, really involved significantly pastoring in the lives of his, life of his congregation. Uh, and he expected them to come to him a lot of the time. And he partly maybe because of his disposition, partly because of his character, um, was somewhat aloof. Some people thought him priggish or proud. I think also partly because he was one of the one or, one or two really significant intellects in New England at that period, I think he found it difficult sometimes to suffer fools gladly. Uh, and I imagine if you are super intelligent, it must be very difficult when you're you know, working in a rural parish and most people are significantly less clever than you. you know, almost no one's had a college education, those sorts of things. Um, and so I think some, t- some of those things actually contributed to his failure as a pastor, um, his failure to make the connection between uh, pulpit and pastoral ministry. And that's something that we can also learn from, but for rather different reasons perhaps. What I'm wondering is, um, if he was living in a culture that was saturated with the gospel and with scripture, it was easier for him to create high theology and then maybe manufacture an application for his people based off of that theology. What I'm wondering is, if, if our same goal is to reach the affections of the people who are sitting before us, how much do we need to then adjust what types of theology or even how high we allow it to be to our culture and and maybe exegete the culture. And if we're to apply something, how much do, as we've been talking about now, about um, applying it specifically to individuals, how much do we really need to understand those things? And, And maybe what are some principles for how pastors can really go about that cultural exegesis combined with a theological uh, stronghold uh, or a strong emphasis, I should say, within our sermons. How can we maybe start to build a, a way forward for these things? And maybe there's a, a pastor from that period who did their application so well because they knew their community that could be an example. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I think maybe the first thing to say is that uh, Edwards is speaking into a particular cultural context. I mean, his sermons aren't sort of culture-free. His approach to the sermon is not culture-free. There are certainly significant things we can learn from what he has to say, but um, I think we also need to be cognizant of the fact that he's speaking to a specific kind of context, and we need to see that for what it is, Um, that in that context there are certain sorts of assumptions about um, his role as a minister, about the, the place of the church, about what was expected in the liturgy on a Sunday morning, all those sorts of things that play into uh, how that affects what people expect when he stands up to to preach in a very high pulpit, all those sorts of things. Cultural references that, by and large, in evangelicalism today in North America, we just don't have in the same way because we are in a different culture in many ways. Um, So I think, uh, it seems to me anyway, one of the fundamental things uh, to say as as one starts to think along those lines is um, Edwards himself is, in a sense, enculturated. And part of what we need to do in our context is to figure out ways in which we can uh, speak the gospel into the particular cultures that 
uh, we find ourselves in. So, I mean, if you're in a, a multicultural um, city in North America, uh, in an urban context, preaching in that kind of context, well then, that's going to require you to do something very significantly different, I think, in terms of expositional preaching than, than what Edwards was trying to do in, in uh, New England in the 18th century. Um, both of those are different kinds of cultures, different kinds of contexts that require, a, you know, the, the similar kind of idea of exegeting scripture uh, and expounding it and applying it to people's lives, but the way you're going to do the shape of that is going to be quite different, I think, in different contexts. Mm-hmm. So, Pastor Moody, mm. do you try to preach to people's affections? Yeah. And if so, do you have principles or strategies that, you know, you, how self-conscious are you about the effort? Yeah, um, I I think it is um, one of the more significant absences from our ministries because because of the Enlightenment heritage, because of the reaction to the Enlightenment with the the Romantic movement in the 19th century that emphasized the sentimental, various, we tend to have this split between reason and emotion and you, you tend to feel that in your own uh, life and mind, I think, in modernity and postmodernity. And the biblical understanding of the heart is a, is a fusion of those two things in relationship to God. That's the sense of the heart. So I think it's very significant. Um, I, I, don't, I don't try to make people feel things. I, I, I try to explain this idea using Edwards concepts or this this theme in such a way that when someone grasps it they will feel things mm-hmm. I think if you try to make people feel things you'll just become a manipulator in the end so try and present this faithfully plainly in that Puritan terminology clearly um, the naked, the naked idea, the Edwards' phrase, that, that theme with crystal clarity, but not just intellectual crystal clarity, um, because there can be a lot of the application work, of course, in Puritan uh, um, technique is really soul work. So it's much more like the whole realm of discussion that Freudian uh, and count, the counseling language took over. You're going back to a pre-Freud time, but all that was done from studying scripture. So there's a lot of soul work. So I try and bring in some of that. So it's not just, you know, the mother at home. It's, it's, the, it's the sin behind the sin. It's, the, it's the, the, the reason why I don't trust. So I'm very conscious about those things, but I, I don't want to try and make someone feel something. I want to try and help someone grasp, well, not in the end the idea, Jesus. I want them to meet him personally. Um, I just finished writing a book chapter about Edward's view of the character of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And he says remarkable things about the character of Scripture. For him, and I I take this to be your working premise as well, Scripture is so inherently powerful and inherently delightful, Mm -hmm. inherently beautiful, Mm -hmm. that uh, showing that to people inevitably affects them, yeah. and raises their hearts. Yeah. It's amazing as a preacher, you think you've constructed these wonderful sentences, and then in your manuscript you start quoting from Scripture. It's amazing the difference the impact has of the Word. I mean, you've got to explain it, understand that, but just the power of the Word in the context is, is extraordinary. So to have the sermon, and that's another, another part of Edward's sermons, he, he, he's always explaining Scripture, but he doesn't just sort of, you know, off his hat towards it. He, he actually quotes Keith. There's a lot of scripture in his preaching. Yeah. Uh, and there's that funny tension for him, and I would imagine yeah. for anyone who preaches similarly, because he's not a lazy preacher. He's, he, he spends a lot of time preparing to preach. Mm-hmm. He labors over his prose. He labors over the word pictures. You know, so, so scripture has this inherent power for him, and the main thing he wants to do is show that to people and open it up for people. But that's not an excuse for laziness on no, his part. No. Yeah. George Marsden, in his, his large uh, tome on, on Edwards, uh, not the short biography, but the long biography, says um, at one point in introducing Edwards' world to perhaps 
non, towards your non theological readers. Imagine a world in which people really believed that the Bible was the Word of God. And there really was a hell. What a difference that would make to you. That may give you the beginnings of an insight into the world of Jonathan Edwards. And I think that's a lot of it. Yeah. Imagine a world where the Bible really is the Word of God. Well, then that makes a very significant difference to the way that you handle the Word of God, I think, in preaching. Yeah. Absolutely. You've got to do a lot more pre work in your handling of Scripture. So that, yeah, I think that's true. And I think the, the, the framework thing, you, adjusting your theology, you want, you want to have a. You want to have a, a human theology that's always going to be adjusted by scripture. But at the same time, when you go to a culture, you don't want to let <coughs> culture adjust your theology, you mean by that, scripture. So there's a, I know you know that, just in terms of terminology, yeah. Dan, we have time for just one more, so you're going to have to pick which person <laughs> gets the last word. <laughs> um, I was wondering, and this, I hope not to <laughs> stir up the discussion, but... Uh, I was wondering if something like contemporary models of the theological interpretation of Scripture might equip pastors to do some of this, to make a shift from contemporary expository preaching to some of what Edwards would consider expository preaching. Yeah, yeah that's a tough question. I was thinking about that in relation to one of the earlier questions about um, you know, whether Edwards is ex application stuff yeah, is really, can we do that today or are we doing something different? Mm -hmm. I mean, I suppose in some respects, the way that people are often taught about how to exegete as opposed to exposit passages mm -hmm. of scripture, um, so emphasize the kind of two horizons or more than two horizons. Uh, you've, got two, you've got the world of the New Testament and they're, what they're doing there and then you've got our world and you've got to somehow make the transition from one world to another in order to understand the text and all that kind of stuff that um, in some respects, perhaps, we, through um, the legacy of historical biblical criticism, have set up something of an obstacle for the preacher. Because then you've got to, as you, as you get into the pulpit, in a sense, you've got to unlearn that in as much as you've got to take what you've got in the New Testament and bring it across 2,000 years to the contemporary. And I suppose, in some respects, Edwards doesn't face that set of challenges. I mean, historical biblical criticism ha had already begun at, at the time that he's writing, but um, it doesn't affect him in quite the same way as it would affect seminarians or ministers today. For my part, I would like to see more emphasis like it was placed on um, not merely exegeting, but expounding. And I think those are two different tasks, and it's important to bear in mind that those are not the same thing. And perhaps sometimes the temptation in the pulpit is to exegete rather than exposit. Perhaps what we need to do is pay attention to that distinction a little bit more carefully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. Yeah.